What next began a couple of years ago with two of us at a cafe table bemoaning the 30% cut in public spending that was coming down the pipeline and which we knew would affect arts and culture as well as welfare and local government and so many other things. We hope someone's doing something about this, we said. And then, damn, I'm so busy. And then, okay, what should we do? We invited arts and cultural organizations from across the country to a meeting, and we called it What Next? because we wanted to ask a simple question. Okay, government says public spending must be cut to reduce the deficit. Agree, disagree is a different issue. It's going to happen. But when, as they predicted at the time, the deficit has been halved in the life of one government, here's the question, will you, government, reinstate this cut to the DCMS? Or is reduced public investment in arts and culture your policy? Just tell us so we know what's coming. What next? Three aspects of that first What Next conference profoundly affected our thinking. One was that it gathered together, was that gathered together were many different types of arts and cultural organizations, big and small, cross art form from right across the country. Museums, galleries, concert halls, orchestras, performance artists, circus artists, as well as theaters and opera and dance companies. That was thrilling and invigorating. A certain buzz was in the air. Two, someone had the genius idea, it certainly wasn't me, that instead of us, who run organizations, making the case, we should each of us bring to the meeting a representative of our audience and let them say why, in their view, art and culture matter. What they said on the day, the head teacher, the older people who danced with the Southern Wales Elders Group, the ex-offender who'd been tutored in her prison by Clean Break, what they said changed everything. And then three, Judith Knight, deeply moved by all this, stood up and said, instead of merely talking to government about funding, we should expand the idea we'd experimented, experimented with that afternoon. We should talk to the electorate, find out what art and culture mean to them. The electorate the public, citizens. You can look at our audience and visitors and our potential audience and visitors through many different lenses, but they're there in their millions. Talk to them was the lesson. Encourage them to make the case. They show up, they get it, they believe. A few months later, a small group, maybe seven or eight of us, mostly arts leaders, met one Wednesday morning at 8.30, the only time we could all get together to discuss these discoveries. An hour later, all of us needing to leave, but all reluctant, we said, well, that was interesting. What are you doing this time next week? Next week, there were 12 of us. The week after, 25. And a month later, we had to carry in a bigger table. One Wednesday, David Welton arrived. I bring with me six orchestras. Then Dave Moutry started a What Next group in Manchester, Andrew Nan the same in Cambridge, Lizzie Crump and I had a day trip to Cardiff, and this afternoon there are 650 of us here in this room. What Next has no structure, nor do we want one. I chair our group because I was asked to, simple as that. It's an experiment. Someone called it a movement. It seems to respond to what people bring to it. Will it survive? As of this moment, we don't know that it will. But what we do know is that, together, we found a style of meeting that produces a certain ethos that leads us forward, that opens up new questions, suggests to us connections and unexpected areas to explore. Positivity, Collegiality, generosity. The only money we had was what those at the table donated. We needed it to pay a couple of our members who, as well as playing a big part in the meetings, also did the work of getting the meetings to happen, this meeting today included. The fact is that what sums we had, enhanced by what you paid to be at this conference, will be pretty well exhausted uh, by the end of today. So what next 
barely exists. And it has no point of view. That was an early decision. We all speak for ourselves. It's an aura. It's a tone of voice. It's an image of the world we want to live in. It's a catalyst. In a sense, what we're doing is what everyone says don't do. We're reinventing the wheel. We're saying, let's do the simple thing. Let's have a conversation. And we're saying, my god, there's a lot of expertise and skill and experience and commitment and dedication and generosity and love in this room. Let's share it. Let's work out what we want to do, and then let's do it together. Yes, we know that others have tried, but hey, who cares? It needs to happen. That's what we all know. And maybe, maybe we found a style, a means, a way. Maybe. We want to make connections. What is the connection between the world of publicly supported arts and culture and the commercial world? How do both of these connect to the millions for whom making art of a thousand different kinds is a passion, though not a profession? What's the connection between the theater under threat in your town square and your favorite drama series on ITV? What's the connection between young people learning dance in schools and the co computer games industry? Between the quality of our singing and the quality of the air that we breathe? Between grants being available to study at art college and the design of our cities and of our streets? Because there is one. The first What Next group still meets every Wednesday at the Young Vic at 8.30. This morning, there were 20 such groups in the heart of London. There could easily be five every week. And of course, not only in London. It's just an idea, but there's no copyright in them. Or if they've changed the law and there is, no one's taken out a patent. How might all these what next groups fit together? As of now, we haven't a clue. But six months ago, we hadn't a clue that we get to today, and here we are.